Well, good morning. Welcome to another Daily Bible Reading. Let me go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we have in your word. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. We pray that you be with us, strengthen us by your spirit. Help us to know and understand and to be able to discern your will through your word. And Father, we pray that you be glorified in the results. And we lift these things up in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at our passage for this morning. And we've got quite a bit of ground to cover. In fact, six chapters in all. Micah chapters 1 through 4, uh, Psalm 10, and Matthew 24. And as we go to the book of Micah, um, we remember that the last few days we were actually in the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is like 66 chapters, and we're nowhere near that. We just covered a few chapters, so why are we jumping to Micah? Well, we're jumping to Micah because there's good reason to believe that a lot of these writings were contemporary to the time of Isaiah. In fact, you will see very many parallels between what we've heard in Isaiah and what we're going to read in Micah. Now, to be quite honest with you, th these prophetic writings are difficult. They are hard to read, and Micah is no exception. From sentence to sentence, you're trying to figure out which pronouns refer to which person, and on top of that, you have a lot of places being referred to, a lot of places that um, sometimes are not referred to anywhere else. And uh, my advice to you that is, is that if you are studying this passage, you probably want to be able to pull out an atlas or some sort of uh, Bible dictionary um, or something, some kind of resource that helps to explain what some of these places are and what may have happened at those places. And sometimes whether those places are referring to places that belong to Israel or Judah or whether it belonged to perhaps an enemy nation, one of the surrounding nations. That too will give you some context as to what um, you know what the prophet is bringing up. All of these things for the original audience would have been, um, you know, they would have understood these things without having to obviously do, do this kind of work because they're living in that world. But for us, as we read through this, a lot of these references will go right over our head. And so when you're studying it, you want to be able to note down those places and try to be able to look them up, have the right kinds of resources. But if you're just reading it as we're doing it as part of this daily Bible reading, um, you want to be able to see the big picture, well, what's being spoken of here. And when it comes to the prophetic writings, it's um, often quite easy to see um, whether the Lord is talking about judgment, whether he's talking about restoration, um, and uh, the, the players that um, are involved, the actors who are involved, and all those kinds of things. So as we go to Micah chapter 1, um, right there in verse 1, we see the word of the Lord came to Micah. And uh, he basically received the word of the Lord, and it says this word uh, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So this word says he saw, so it's uh, probably in a vision. And we see in verse 2, the Lord begins to address all the people. And this is basically the Lord um, portraying himself as the judge. He is now going to arise. He is going to bring a sentence um, upon them. It's not going to be a good sentence. Uh, that's why in verse 2 we read, Listen, O peoples, all of you, listen, O earth, and all it contains. Let the Lord God be a witness against you. The Lord from his holy temple, this is talking about the holy temple in heaven, not the temple that was built on earth. For behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountain will melt under him and the valleys will be split like wax before the fire, like water poured down a steep place. So the coming of our Lord, when he comes in judgment, it's going to be um, like a cataclysmic event. It's going to be a very noticeable event in, in which we're going to see some extraordinary things um, happening. And verse 5, we see all this is for the rebellion of Jacob for, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the rebellion of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And remember, Samaria was that region in the northern kingdom where the king often inhabited. What is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? And that's where the temple was, and that's where the king of Judah was. Verse 6, For I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the open country, planting places for a vineyard. I will pour her stones down into the valley. I will lay bare her foundations. And then we see this judgment against idolatry. All of her idols will be smashed. All of her earnings will be burned with fire. All of her images I will make desolate, for she collected them from a harlot's earnings. And to the earnings of a harlot they will return. And then we see a lament being lifted up. And it's actually unclear to me whether this lament is from the Lord or whether it's from Micah. 
Um, either way, it's ultimately coming from the Lord, but we see a lament here being expressed. Because of this, I must lament and wail. I must go barefoot and naked. I must make a lament like jackals and a mourning like the ostriches. <clears throat> ostriches. For her wound is incurable, for it has come to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. And when it says it has come to Judah, I believe this is referring to the judgment. Tell it not to Gath. And now we're going to see a number of places being mentioned. Tell it not to Gath. Weep not at all. At Bethlehem, Afra, roll yourself in the dust. Go on your way, inhabitant of Shafir in shameful nakedness. The inhabitant of Za'anan does not escape. The lamentation of Beth Azel. He will take from you its support. For the inhabitants of Meroth become weak, waiting for good, because a calamity has come down. And here we see a calamity has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. So we see very clearly this lament, even if we don't recognize all these places, the lament leads to a calamity that's being brought by the Lord to the gates of Jerusalem. And verse 13, harness the chariot to the team of horses, O inhabitant of Lakshish. She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, because in you were found the rebellious acts of Israel. And then we see a promise that Israel will be humbled. Verse 14, therefore you will give parting gifts on behalf of Moreshe Gath. The houses of Akzib will become a deception to the kings of Israel. So I believe this is calling upon others who are outside to serve as really stumbling blocks for the kings who are the leaders of Israel. Moreover, I will bring on you the one who takes possession, O inhabitant of Marashe. The glory of Israel will enter Adulam. Make yourself bald, cut off your hair because of the children of your delight. Extend your baldness like eagles, for they will go from you into exile. So I believe this is calling foreign nations and saying that you're going to take my people into exile um, to your land. And so we see that means of humbling being promised unto Israel. And then in chapter 2, we see a woe. And remember, a woe is a pronouncement of condemnation. And we saw that in the book of Isaiah. We've seen that in the book of Matthew. Now we're seeing it here in Micah. And much of the woes are very similar to where we've seen in other places. It's people who bring deceit. It's people who bring oppression. It's people who take advantage wrongly of, of people who, are, um, who have less than them. Um, woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they do it, for it is the power of their hands. They covet fields and then seize them. And we saw that uh, with the king Ahab. <clears throat> you may, may remember further back when we were in the book of either, it was either the end of 1 Kings or maybe in the beginning of 1 Kings, that Ahab had covered a, coveted a field of a man named Naboth. And uh, Jezebel ends up helping him get it by making sure that the owner is assassinated because he didn't want to give it up. So they covet fields and they seize them and houses and take them away. They rob a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, the Lord says, Behold, I am planning against this family a calamity from which you cannot remove your necks and you will not walk haughtily, for it will be an evil time. And when we see an evil time, this is not so much moral evil, but this is talking about calamity. This is talking about destruction or something disastrous to come upon them. And verse 4, on that day they will take up against you a taunt. Um, they, uh, being whoever it is that's going to bring this calamity, they will take up against you a taunt and utter a bitter lamentation and say, we are completely destroyed. He exchanges the portion of my people, how he removes it from me to the apostate. He apportions our fields. Um, so the fields that they have will be given to others. Um, and uh, verse 5, therefore you have no one stretching a measuring line for you by lot in the assembly of the Lord. And not only that, but in verse 6, we see that the two true prophets are being told to be silent, while the false prophets are the ones who are speaking. And this is where things can get a little bit confusing, because you see, for instance, a couple of um, pronouns here, they, and then they here. And in this case, um, the first they is actually um, talking about the false prophets, and then the second they is talking about the true prophets. So this is where things can get a little bit confusing, but if you slow down, I think it becomes uh, more understandable. So what we see in verse 6, do not speak out. <clears throat> what is that? That's a statement being spoken from the false prophets to the true prophets, including Micah. So Micah is hearing from the false prophets to him, do not speak out. And instead, they are the ones to speak out. So they speak out. 
But if they do not speak out concerning these things, reproaches will not, not be turned back. <clears throat> so in other words, I, I believe this is saying that if the true prophets do not speak out concerning these things, concerning what Israel's being judged for, then reproaches will not be turned back. In other words, Israel will not have an opportunity to repent. And then in verse 7, we read, Is it being said, O house of Jacob, is the Spirit of the Lord impatient? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to the one walking uprightly? And as we go through these verses, it's very difficult to figure out which one is being spoken by the true prophets versus the false prophets. And, and so this would take a lot of t more time to sort out. But I believe verse 7 is referring to the fact that uh, though there is judgment upon the land, it's not the nature of the Lord to always be impatient or to always be angry. Uh, but we see at the end of verse 7, do not my words do good to the one walking uprightly. So in other words, the true prophets who are trying to let the Israelites know that this judgment is coming upon them because of their rebellion and disobedience, it can go away if they simply repent. But what we see in verse 8 instead is recently my people have arisen as an enemy. You strip the robe off of the garment from unsuspecting passerbys, from those returned from war, the women of my people you evict. So we see that the people and probably the leaders were taking advantage of those who were less, uh, less fortunate. Um, including those coming back from war who should have been honored. Um, women in verse 9 who were to be protected. Um, they were um, taken advantage of. They were evicted, each one from her pleasant house, from her children. You take my splendor forever. Arise and go, for this is no place of rest because of the uncleanness that brings on destruction, a painful destruction. And then verse 11, if a man walking after wind and falsehood had told lies and said, I will speak out, to you concerning wine and liquor, he would be a spokesperson to this people. And so I believe this is a condemnation against the people, saying that even if a person is just walking after wind and falsehood, which is obviously not a good thing, but if he said, I'm going to speak to you about wine and liquor, um, then they would accept him. So <clears throat> I believe that this is really talking about how Israel were seeking prophets who were really tickling their own ears. And then in verse 12, we see that there will be a remnant that uh, will be preserved and, and regathered. Verse 12, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. They will be noisy with men. The breaker goes up before them. And the breaker, this is referring to a shepherd, one who clears the way for the sheep. They break out, pass through the gate, and go by it. So their kings go on before them and the Lord at their head. So there is a time in which Israel will be brought back together. Um, they will be led out by a true shepherd. They will be led out by the Lord. And so this is obviously looking to a future time. And this could very well be the millennial kingdom when Jesus Christ returns. Or it could be a reference to the eternal state. And then we get to Micah chapter 3, and we see that justice is being perverted by the leaders. And that is often the case as um, Israel has been spiraling downwards. And I said, hear now, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear off their skin from them and their flesh from their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skin from them, break their bones, chop them up as the pot and as meat in a kettle. Now, I don't believe that this is literally talking about cannibalism, that they're doing this to each other. Um, but I think this is symbolic of just how they're murdering one another um, just uh, by the, um, the unjust ways of the rulers and the leaders. And justice was a very important trait that was supposed to be characterized throughout the land and especially those who were in the positions of authority and of power. Verse 4, then they will cry out to the Lord. I believe that's talking about those who are being consumed. Um, or no, this is talking about the leaders. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them at that time because they have practiced evil deeds. And then we see a denouncement against the false prophets. Thus says the Lord consider, concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. When they have something to bite with their teeth, they cry peace. But against him who puts nothing in their mouths, they declare holy war. So this is similar to what we'll see in Jeremiah, that uh, the false prophets proclaim peace when there is no peace. And then verse 6, therefore, it will be night for you without vision and darkness for you without divination. The sun will go down on the prophets and the day will become dark over them. So they're not going to be able to see anything. They won't have any visions. And verse 7, the seers, uh, which is a, another 
word often used for prophets, the seers will be ashamed and the diviners will be embarrassed. Indeed, they will all cover their mouths because there is no answer from God. And then verse 8, this is condemnation upon all the leaders. They're all denounced. On the other hand, I am filled with power with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellious act, even to Israel his sin. Now hear this, heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with violent injustice. So we see just how these two nations are, are being described. Uh, verse 11, her leaders pronounce justice, judgment for a bribe. And that's not easy to see, not hard to see that that's obviously injustice. Her priests instruct for a price, her prophets divine for money, yet they lean on the Lord saying, is not the Lord in our midst, calamity will not come upon us. So this is them uh, not only taking money when they shouldn't have been taking money, uh, but claiming that what they receive is from the Lord. And then also uh, proclaiming here when he says calamity will not come upon us, telling them that there's going to be peace when really the Lord is not bringing peace, but he is going to bring destruction upon them. Verse 12, therefore, on account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field. Jerusalem will become heap of ruins and the mountain of the temple will become high places of a forest. And so these judgments here are, are really directed um, uh, mostly against uh, Judah and Jerusalem, it sounds like. <clears throat> Though earlier we do see um, Jacob, his rebellious act, even Israel, his sin being mentioned, and the heads of the house of Jacob. So it alternates. The judgments we see being mentioned um, alternates in terms of who is being addressed. And then in Micah chapter 4, we see something very similar than, to what we saw in Isaiah chapter 2. In Isaiah chapter 2, we see, saw that the nations were going to come to see the Lord. They were going to come for... Um, to know the Lord, but also that the Lord would be judging them as well. And so verse 2, it says, it will come about in the last days. Um, so this is eschatological. This is sometime in the future. Um, and I believe this is probably the millennial kingdom first and then the eternal state. That the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So I do believe this is the millennial kingdom. Verse three, and he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. And never again will they train for war. And we saw almost the exact same words here in Isaiah chapter 2. Each of them will sit under his vine, under his fig tree, with no one to make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Though all the peoples walk, each in the name of his God, and so we see here some forms of um, idolatry. So, though all the peoples walk, each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, even those whom I have afflicted. And I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now and forever. And then as we go to verse 8, we see that uh, Judah, here's a prophecy about Judah in Babylon and how they will be rescued from Babylon. As for you, tower the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come. Even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. And so that's referring to the southern kingdom. Now, why do you cry out loudly? There is there no king among you or has your counselor perished? That agony that gripped you like a woman in childbirth, writhe and labor to give birth daughter of Zion like a woman in childbirth. For now you will go out of the city, dwell in the field and go to, to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. But now many nations have assembled against you who say, let her be polluted. Let our eyes gloat over Zion. So at this point, um, Zion is not Zion. Judah um, has many nations assembled against them. Verse 12, but they do not know the thoughts of the Lord and they do not know, understand his purpose. For he has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, daughter of Zion, for your horn I will make iron and for your hooves I will make bronze, that you may pulverize many people. So this is promising victory over those enemies. That you may devote to the Lord their unjust gain, 
and their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. And then we go to Psalm 10, and in Psalm 10, we see um, a psalm that really talks about the prosperity of the wicked. And this is a little bit unusual because we see in the Old Testament that God promises prosperity to those who obey, and he promised to judge those who disobey, especially within his kingdom. But we do see a reality that even the wicked do prosper, and especially enemy nations, people who are against Israel. Um, but even within the nation of Israel, there may be uh, the wicked who prosper as well. And so we see a lament being lifted up for that. Verse 1, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In pride the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. The wicked, in the haughtiness of his countenance, does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. And so this is the definition, the very definition of a fool. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. As for all his adversaries, he snorts at them. So this is talking about the wicked person who denies God, who is prosperous, who thinks that God has no power over him and that he is able to snort even at his those who oppose him. <clears throat> Verse 6, he says to himself, I will not be moved throughout all generations. I will not be in adversity. His mouth is full of curses and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. He sits in the lurking places of the villages and the hiding places. He kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. He lurks in the hiding place as a lion in his lair. He lurks to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws him to his net. So this is the way that the wicked are just very deceitful and how they catch other people by surprise when they attack. Verse 10, he crouches, he bows down, and the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. He says to himself, God has forgotten, he has hidden his face, he will never see it. And so the very definition of a fool. And then we see the call to the Lord to arise and respond. Verse 12, arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand, do not forget the afflicted. Why has the wicked spurned God? He has said to himself, you will not require it. You have seen it, and you have beheld mischief and vexation to take it into your hand. The unfortunate commits himself to you. You have been the helper of the orphan. And so this is a reminder that, uh, as we call out to God, that God has been the helper of those who are helpless. And verse 15, break the armor, arm of the wicked, and the evildoers seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. Nations have perished from his land. O Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to vindicate the orphan and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth will no longer cause terror. And that brings us to Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, remember, we are now in the final week um, leading up to Jesus Christ's arrest. In chapter 22, he had a series of confrontations between himself and the Jewish leaders where they tried to trip him up with all kinds of questions. And then in Matthew 23, we saw a series of just scathing statements of condemnation from Jesus to these religious leaders. And now in Matthew chapter 24, what we have is really Jesus talking about the end times. Um, but first, at the beginning of chapter 24, he addresses his disciples and he talks about the destruction that's going to come to the temple. Verse 1, Jesus came out of the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they're asking Jesus a few things. When will these things happen? In other words, when will this temple be destroyed? When will you return? When will be the end of the age? And they probably thought that all of these things would happen at the same time, but that's not the case. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for these things must take place, but that is not yet the end. So Jesus is describing that things are going to get worse, not better. There's going to be wars, there's going to be rumors of wars. And verse 7, he says, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. 
So it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so even unbelievers, when they talk about why is there so much evil in the world, well, we know the reason why. It's because of sin. But we even see from the words of Jesus Christ himself that even after Jesus has come and even after the gospel will be spread, we still see that the world will get worse and worse before the end comes. And then starting in verse 9, we see that tribulation is coming. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Wow, this is a tremendous statement from Jesus to his disciples that they will be killed. They will kill you. You will be hated by all nations strictly because of my name. And verse 10, at that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And it's interesting that we read through Micah and we saw a lot being said about false prophets, but false prophets will arise even in the future as well. Verse 12, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through the through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. And I'll just point out that there's a lot of debate about this abomination of desolation. Is this talking about the destruction of the temple? Is this talking about um, the end times uh, when just before Jesus comes? Um, you know, those are issues that that people are debating and must be worked out. I don't have a firm position on that. Some people believe this already happened when the temple was destroyed in AD 70. Um, I don't believe that is the case, though it certainly could be. Verse 17, whoever is on the doorstep must not was must not go down to get things out of out that are in his house. Whoever and this is talking about how bad things are going to be. Verse 18, whoever's in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation as such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. Uh, verse 12, unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And so just this description that this great tribulation will be such as that has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, that's what moves me away from thinking that he's describing the destruction of the temple that happened in AD 70, because the description here seems like it's going to be something unprecedented. And as bad as the destruction of the temple was back then, I don't believe it re reaches that kinds of levels. So verse 23, now Jesus is going to warn about false Christ. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christ, false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So the Son of Man will come like a flash of lightning, but there will be many false uh, Christs that come before then. Verse 28, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. This wording, by the way, this reads very much like the Old Testament prophets when they were prophesying of the future events of the coming of the Lord or uh, the, the judgment that the Lord would bring. And for good reason, Jesus Christ is another prophet and he is prophesying of a lot of the difficulties that will come in the future, a lot of the enemies of, the, uh, of God and God's people who will arise. And verse 30, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one each of the sky to the other. Now learn the parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and put forth its leaves. You know that summer is near. So you too, when you see these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. And in verse 34, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. 
And this right here would be the argument for a lot of what he's talking about being happening in AD 70, because if he is referring to this generation being that exact generation of people that they will not pass away until all these things take place, um, then indeed you can see why people think that describes the events of AD 70. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So we see an illustration here of the great flood, that just as the great flood took them by surprise, so too the Son of Man will take them by surprise and will wipe them out much in the same way that the flood wiped out <clears throat> the population upon the earth in Genesis. And so we see here people will be taken away in verse 40. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. And so this uh, would seemingly, this could perhaps be describing the rapture when the Lord comes. He's going to rapture his church up to him. Not everyone believes that, um, but these would be verses that uh, would uh, be interpreted by many to be that. And verse 42, therefore be on the alert and for you do not know which day your Lord is coming, but be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. And so all through this, you're seeing this repeated warning that the Lord is going to come back when you don't expect him. He's going to come back when you don't expect him. And then we finish with kind of this picture of both faithful and evil slaves. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave from whom his master put in charge of the household to give them, give them food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the masters of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour which he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that is the description often given to the eternal torment that we call hell. Well, that brings us to the end of our reading for this morning. That was quite a few verses and chapters to cover um, some difficult passages, um, but good passages for you to expose yourselves to, even if you don't fully grasp it now, if they're very difficult to grasp or understand, the more you read it, the more familiar you'll become with it. So don't lose hope um, in all that. And certainly as we look to this chapter in Matthew that we just read, um, what we can take out of this for certain is that Jesus is coming back. And he's, gonna, he's coming back in a time that people do not expect him to come back. And at that time, he will bring about his judgment. But those who truly are faithful, those who truly belong to the Lord, they will be protected um, and they will be um, ultimately rewarded. Let me go ahead and close out in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and these words. Thank you for your spirit. Uh, we understand that your word is not always easy to grasp. But there are a lot of things that we may not fully comprehend. I pray that you would continue to bless us by your spirit. Help us to understand, help us to grow according to that understanding. And I pray that you would continue to just protect the church of your son, Jesus Christ, in all things. And may you be glorified. And we pray these things in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning, and we will be back again tomorrow morning. Um, hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, and God bless.